Violence is threatening all aspects of society. This is characterized by increasing reports that show that extortion is really taking a hold on society. Join us in this week's show as we take a look at the spate of criminality and its impact on the working class. Workers World starts now. England to Poland, every step across the ocean, the ruling classes, them is in a mess. Oh yes, the capitalist system are regress, but the Soviet system now progress. So which one of them you think? Welcome to our Workers World Show. I'm your host, Sharif Trubadi. Thank you very much for joining us this week. As we take a look at crime and violence in South Africa that has spiked over the past decade, official statistics show that violent crimes like murder, robbery, and rape have all increased since 2022. Women and children bear the brunt of this violent crime, which tends to thrive in community situations of poverty. The country's long history of violence can be traced back to the historical eras of colonialism and apartheid, where extreme violence was key to assert power and the rule of the oppressors. It included the destruction and the disruption of indigenous societies and customs. Today, this legacy of violence lives on, and in today's show, we take a look at the causes and the impact of crime and violence on working class communities. Moreover, how should we respond to it? Before we get into our conversation, let's now go to our insert, of course, prepared for us by the Workers' World Media Productions editorial team. Pay us or risk being a victim of crime. That's the ultimatum. Allegedly, the suspect has been arrested after he allegedly shot at a member of the National Intervention Unit in Mtata West in the Eastern Cape. All alleged extortionists have been killed by the Western Cape Police in a shootout. Eight suspects have been shot dead by a police multidisciplinary team in Kayalicha. And among those uh, crimes that are on the general increase, you have murders, you have rape, you have uh, hijackings, kidnapping for ransom payments, and extortions. Crime in Africa, all the Baloba, Exen, Nikbans, Mamas, Pangele, especially in Kosali Winda, Namosia Road. Crime in our area is robbery and uh, gunshots, and it affects our people, our youngsters. Uh, the gangsterism. And what affects for us is like, uh, we are not free to walk. To tell them not that, but you know what? Children have to be kept up in the house, you see. People of different walks of life has been dumped in Mitchell Spring. That is, and on the Cape Plus specifically, if you look into the townships and all those things. So unemployment is arrived, poverty is arrived in our communities. And until there's a way of dealing with the socio-economic challenges that we're having in our communities, we will have crime. And of course, access to firearms plays a big role in serial murder rates. There was a robbery. Um, excessive drinking, alcohol is a very strong indicator or contributing to violent behavior. So because you have high levels of corruption across most state departments, um, then your private sector, your gangs, your organized criminal networks, find ways of extracting money from the state because they can. I want to criminal records. And the guys who come to prison is a gang team, like it's a 28. Then he said, Yesterday, he come to me, brother, you don't know me, just I come to from prison. Yes, I need sugar, coffee, and then uh, bread. I need it for free. Why must I give it for free, my bro? I'm paying this. I'm going to show you. 28 is coming. He told me yesterday. But this morning, he gripped the phone. We welcome this opportunity to make a statement to the House on threats posed by the current wave of extortions and other related crimes in parts of the country. What we're seeing is the emergence of people who, some of whom have, have actually emerged through things like being hitmen or cash and transit heists, 
um, or armed robbers, etc. And they've begun to develop themselves as dons in those areas. So if you look at some of the arrests that have been made in Cape Town of people like name is Barra, he has been involved in a number of different criminal activities and then became an extortion kingpin in the area. Soweto is also a place where that has received our attention in the incidence of extortion. In Free State, the target of extortionists include pensioners and people who receive rough. Extortion is not only killing people that they want to extort from. It's killing the community in terms of development when there are projects in the community that once that is aimed at uplifting the community. These projects are stopped because of extortionists. We also see that the economy, especially the township economies, is going under as a result of extortion. We do have currently an operation with the president, Operation Chanel, which is a program that we started uh, last year. We have achieved over 800,000 arrest with the Operation Shanela. You've got to dramatically strengthen your intelligence capabilities. You understand who's committing most of the crimes, the networks, the modus operandi, how they smuggle guns, how they get drugs into the country, how they distribute, all that kind of stuff. You, and, and that's possible because these are physical human beings in our network. Since last year to this year, we have trained over a thousand detectives, new detectives. And we are currently this year employing uh, re-listing, that is re-employment of 200 detectives. We would have loved to employ more because they are available, but unfortunately, uh, again, on the availability of budget, we could only, uh, initially we wanted 400, but we can only take 200 uh, for re-enlistment. If you look at our docket on a day, I mean, realistically speaking, even if you want to complain as, as communities, each officer, how many dockets does he have a day? And there's, there's so much. And when you look at it, there's, there's not enough resources for them to execute their work. So what we did was in a particular street, we have a street committee. So if I'm an addict in that particular street, on a Friday to, to Sunday evening, we would play games in front opposite the drug dealer. So the demand, which is our children, we would say, no, the shop is closed. The police then deal with the, de with the supplier, which is the drug dealer. And that was effective. If, if the community start to trust subs, then communities won't shy away to be witnesses and say, I saw so-and-so is the one who killed so-and-so. But because people, they are not doing that, because they are scared that they are not safe. Because also subs, they must also monitor how they conduct themselves when they come to our areas. Because we see some of the shenanigans that they do. They, call, they are cozy with thugs. We see them hanging around with thugs, drinking with thugs, drinking and socializing with questionable characters in our society, seeing police vans, stopping in certain areas. So we need, we need subs to do away with that. All right, so there we've seen uh, the impact really that crime has and the type of complaints that are coming forward. The question is how long can this go on and what are the interventions uh, required? We'll deal with that and a lot more others once we do return from the break. Do stay with us. All right, welcome back to the Workers' World Show. We are talking about criminality and the spate of crime that clearly is impacting all facets of society, increasing reports of extortion targeting not just schools, but even something as simple as a crash is what we've been hearing in the last uh, couple of weeks. And let's pick up on that now. And we have uh, in studio with us, uh, to my furthest left, Tim Borni Diuli, uh, the Gender Equality Programs Coordinator. We also have uh, Michael Jacobs with us. He's the Deputy Chairperson of the Mitchell's Plain United Residents Association, as well as Francina Lucas that joins us, the National Chairperson uh, from the uh, Crime Community Forum uh, with us here as well. Thank you uh, very much, gentlemen and lady, for having uh, joined us. I want to maybe just start off uh, with you, Michael, from a, a sort of community perspective to understand why it would appear that crime seems to have not just taken a stranglehold of society, but it has almost inserted itself into different facets of society. How would you describe crime in its, in its current setting at the moment? 
Good morning, Tassari Ken, to our guests, other guests. Now, let me be very blunt. The Cape Palace is in a crisis. Policing is in a crisis. And in the middle of it is our communities, our historically disadvantaged communities on the Cape Flats, whether it's Kailitsa, whether it's Mitzos Plain, whether it's Elzeza River, whether it's Delft, our people are dying. And it is our kids mostly that are dying. And what we have seen is that politicians come for photo opportunities and during election time to make promises of halving the crime rate, the murder rate. But in 2019, the Premier of the Western Cape launched a LEAP program, mm -hmm. Law Enforcement Advancement Program, in which they claim they will halve the murder rate by 50%. The elections has come and gone, 2024. And in fact, crime has increased. Those identified areas on the Cape Flats, whether it's your Kelsa River, whether it's your Bishop Lavis, whether it's your Kailitsa, Google to Nyanga, where law enforcement has been placed to assist steps, has not uh, bring about the desired results. Okay, I, I want to understand why, uh, and maybe if Francina, if we can bring you in here at this time, uh, why does it seem that we are losing this war against crime? Good morning um, to you as a presenter of the show. Also, good morning to the colleagues in the studio. Also, the viewers at home, good morning. I think the question is really a question that is worth asking. Why are we losing this fight against crime? Um, for us, from a community policing perspective, it was always important to have government, all three spheres of government, the local, the provincial, and the national government, working, collaborating more closely together. In that way, also sharing the resources, be it in terms of um, vehicles, personnel, data, so that the crime fighting initiatives that we see in our communities on the Cape Flats and in our townships can have, have a, a better impact and can also yield more positive results. What we've seen in the past was that all these spheres of government working on their own, trying to fight crime on their own with minimal to very little impact. So we have been advocating for government as a whole to come together, to work together in the best interest of our communities. And we saw the historical signing of the cooperation agreement between the Western Cape government, the National Police Department, as well as the city of Cape Town. We saw it happening and that gave us a renewed hope that things will improve. But more importantly for us is the community component and the community participation in um, that agreement because we cannot have a situation where government sit in their offices, decide what must happen and want to come down to implement in our communities without us. So we are saying nothing for us um, without us. We want to be part, we want to participate because after all, we are the people. The, 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 the problem though, Francina, is that, um, you know, these people live amongst us. They come from, from our communities. Um, and, 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 you know, we almost see the breeding of this crime for varying reasons. I want to look at what some of those 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 factors are. But Temboni, um, is there a practical way to begin to deal with this crime? Let's even, let's for instance, focus on extortion, where, you know, we all grew up at some stage where, you know, the taxi driver gets robbed from his monies or, or um, you know, the, the routes are impacted by whatever sorts of criminality. 
but now it's gotten so out of hand that businesses in those communities cannot even survive. Workers cannot even go to work, etc. That's how out of control it has become. Do you have an idea about what could have led us down this path? Um, when, when, when I think about that, um, I think we have a major challenge. One, there's lack of um, police services in the community. And the police that are there maybe are a little bit stretched. But I also think we have a responsibility as communities uh, because the, the people that are committing these crimes are coming from the same community. And as long as a community, we're not responding to that. We're not standing up as a community and helping the police to be able to tackle that. Then we will be fighting a losing battle um, because whoever is doing it, an extortion, I'm sure in each area people are known. But there isn't, there seem to be no strategy or no um, cooperation between the community and the police in a specific area. So for me, I see that as a challenge. However, as, as Mosaic, we try to um, form what we call safe platforms to look at if we have a challenge in this community within um, service delivery. How do we as organizations in that specific community, together with the police, try and find ways, practical ways of dealing with issues? Because we're thinking, if CPF, for example, are working in isolation and neighborhood watch are working in isolation and Mosaic are working in isolation, then it's not really servicing the community because it's about me, it's about me, it's about me. So how do we make sure that we have a united, um, coordinated um, collaboration in all the issues that we tackle in a specific community? Fratina mentioned, uh, mentioned this uh, historical agreement that she says was signed between City of Cape Town, the South African Police Services, national government. Could cooperation like that work? I think it could, but for me, it's not. I think we can sign a cooperation, but if we're not having a practical plan on how we implement it, um, then then it's just, it's just going to be a document. Uh, for me, I'm, I'm more about what's practical. What is it that we're going to do on the ground? And when are we doing that? And what are the plans and activities that we're going to foster to make sure or implement to make sure whatever agreements we have, mm. they are being implemented? Uh, let's look at the, um, Michael, to come back to the, the LEAP uh, program, law enforcement um, program that, that you highlighted there, it could be argued that this is not really the, the competence or the expertise of the provincial government, but they've gone to find money, albeit that they've taken maybe from somewhere else, but they've gone to find money to try and also bring to the table a solution. Why do you think that solution is not working? Now, it, it's clearly saying currently we're having a major education crisis where we're going to have cutbacks of teachers, which will result that we will have more children in the classroom. Now, the premier of the Western Cape Island Windy has taken from the health and education budget more than a billion in order to plow into a reservist program of the city to make the city look good because they have a political interest of why they want to have this LEAP program because they want to force national government to have more devolution of powers where they want to establish their own provincial police with their own, own with their own oversight mechanism and money then being plowed into. But what we have seen, although there are LEAP officers working in certain demarcated areas, even in Mitchell's Plain, gang violence continuing, the killings are continuing, even after the cooperation agreement was signed between the city, the province, and national government, which is your SAP's component, we have seen that mass shootings and killings are still happening. Now, the other day, we had a mass but, but, but can I ask you, can I ask you, you know, what, what is the alternative to this? Because if, if you're saying that the approach from the West Cape government is wrong, is the South African Police Service the most competent body then to bring the crime under control? What I'm saying it is, SAPS is also in a crisis. We have seen the infighting amongst SAPS within the Western Cape. We have seen that certain senior police officers has been sidelined. 
We have also seen that, and I'm speaking now about Mitchell Spring, for this year alone in a year, there's been three station commanders. The one was removed after again another gun scandal. Then it, he was replaced by a station commander in December last year. The station commander is no longer the station commander. He's now a new station commander, Brigadier Miller. So that instability when it comes to SAP's management within a specific area, that creates uncertainty. That don't create stability because you need stability within your SAP's management in Be order for communities. This problem, yeah. And I mean, it's, it's further compounded by reports just this week about the general within the police service having uh, appointed, you know, another general, or, uh, in fact, having, uh, you know, granted a, 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 an advancement for another general that has a well-established relationship with underworld uh, figures. How does that take us forward? in dealing with this crime. We'll, we'll pick up on that and more just after the break. Do stay with us. We are taking a look at crime and violence in South Africa and the impact that that has on working class communities. The increasing reports around extortion that have come to characterize the way in which particularly very simple places of work are coming under threat. We have a series of guests, of course, with us, two at least in studio. And of course, Francina Lucas joins us online, the national chairperson for uh, the Crime Community Forum. Uh, I, I want to deal with what has always been a very tricky issue and, and maybe to start off, uh, with you, Temboni, whether um, poverty is the inhibitor to this crime. Can poverty be blamed for it? <laughs> um, that's a very challenging question. <laughs> um, I think there's, there's, there's many issues, actually, that impact on, on that. Um, because if, if we were to say only poverty is the cause, then, then we're looking at it in one, in one approach. I think there's various approaches. Uh, one of the approaches is greediness and un unemployment. Because um, you, you might find that some people that are doing these crimes are well off, it's just that they need more. And, and a second one is uh, unemployment. You find graduates that are not employed. And of course, they're very smart. They're going to come up with strategies mm. to, to be able to, to, to make a living out of. And, and we, so um, we can we cannot. I'm saying we cannot only blame um, the poverty, but I also want to challenge communities because, I mean, we, we we can always blame the government as much as we as we like, but we also as individuals and in this community have a responsibility to play um, because it's not only one's fight; it's all our fight. For example, in in Philippi, two organizations pull out. Um, and those organizations were bringing a service to the same community that um, is challenging them, is asking extortion from them. So the organization decided to pull out. Um, so the, co the, the, the community now is going to lose that service. One of the, one of the organizations, I'm not going to mention name, was bringing youth, em youth employment into the, into the area of Philippi. But because of crime, and, and the, the, the managers of the, of the organization being attacked and robbed in the area, they pulled out. So that means we're not gonna get, get that service in that community. Um, for me, it's, it's not necessarily that because people that are doing that, they know what they're doing. Um, another organization's cars were hijacked, mm. that service in Philippi. And they, they were hijacked a couple of times. Um, and it's, it's, it's known what the organization does in the community. It's not that the organization is not known. Um, so people that are doing that, they know why they're doing it. It's pure it's, criminal, criminality. It's pure criminality. It? There's no justice, There's no, no? No. I'm poor, I need to buy bread at the end of the day, so no. let me extort money from people. No, and, and for example, if I may share a, a little bit, so th this organization was broken into, and then they took gazebos. And then on the weekend, the gazebos were seen at the car wash in Samora Michelle. And so that means the person that's doing that is not doing because they're yeah. struggling. 
they're doing it because they just want, want money to enjoy themselves, maybe. Yeah. So it's not necessary. I think we, we cannot blame only poverty um, towards it. So, th so there's many elements. Yeah. Um, uh, Francina, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Um, you know, what drives the very community that benefits from employment uh, opportunities as well as other services, what drives sections of that community to attack that very help? Yes, I, I really want to agree with the previous speaker and by saying we cannot isolate and all, only say it's due to poverty. And I also want to make a point that really it's not the whole of the community um, that are making themselves guilty of criminality. Instead, it's a very small portion of the community uh, that are holding the rest of the community ransom uh, by intimidation, by instilling fear to um, do what they are doing in terms of the illegal activities. So what drives it, it's a whole lot of factors of which poverty definitely is one. But if we look at unemployment in our communities, and who are the victims and who are the perpetrators of most of the crimes that we see. It's young people because they are unemployed. Some of them feel that, that there's nothing else left for them than to be recruited into these groupings, into the gangs, and then starting to commit crimes. So yes, I want to agree there's a low, whole range of factors also inequality it still uh, plays its role in ensuring that um, criminality and crime um, are persisting to plague our communities uh, michael you've been in the space of crime fighting for a very long time and you've seen how different trends have have taken you know hold of course extortion is not a new one but it has really taken off quite a bit in the last a couple of months and in the last couple of years. Let me ask you the same question. You know, is poverty an inhibitor? Does it, does it, does it entice those to commit the fate and the level of crimes that we are talking about? We want to see, really we need to look at how can government together with private sector and communities change the social conditions of our communities on the ground and we have seen that because of the special injustice during the apartheid years, people being thrown onto the Cape Flats and to other areas where people were just dumped. There's very little job opportunities or opportunities for young people after they matriculated. And that is the biggest problem. But when one look at, at, at extortion, let us bring it closer to home. I'm from Mitchell's Plain. There was a housing project almost 20 years in the making in Beacon Valley mm. on three big plots of land along Highlands Drive and then Swartcliffe. That project was stopped in 2023 by the mayor and his team. Why? Because of extortion. And it is not extortionists coming from outside. The culprit is from Mitchell's Plain. And 1,809 housing opportunities was lost because the project has been canned. Sure. Because of extortion, we have seen that there was attempted murder cases. People were shot on that, on that uh, construction site. Fences were removed. Uh, developers were intimidated, and so that opportunity is lost, which means uh, 1,809 families wouldn't be able to benefit. Then we also have seen the Praza revitalization on the Mitchell's Plain line, which hasn't been around for seven years, which means people now have to take buses and taxis, which cost more out of people's pockets, working people's pockets, mm -hmm. about 60% of the pay is just going for transport because the trains is not running. And when we started, Prasa started with the revitalization of the Mitchell's Plain line of the Lentech here, Captain's Club and Mitchell's Plain station, extortionists also wants to 
be part of that project and to benefit. Luckily, it was nipped in the bud because the police with the community and community leadership has been proactive to say, no, we won't allow extortionists to just come and destroy what is being rebuilt within Mitchell's plain. The similar thing happened within my city in the beginning on AZ Perman, where these gangsters and whoever they are wanted to come and extort because they want to have a piece of the pie. And again, we as a community say no. So those projects are now on track because the community is standing up against these extortioners. Mm -hmm. So you can see if community starts to take ownership and working with government, working with the police, forwarding that information, then we can make a difference. And how do we get to that point is the question I want to get into once we do return uh, from the break. What role do community share in trying to nip it in the bud, as Michael so highlighted? We'll deal with that and a lot more once we do return from the break. Do stay with us. It is workers' world, and we are talking about this spread of criminality that we see, and just the, how violent that has become threatening going to work and the working class environment. We've been talking about extortion, and as Michael highlighted, there were 1,809 families could not get a home, and you can multiply that one by four or five on average people would have lived inside that particular home. This was a case in, in Beacon Valley. You may recall the case in Delft, where a city of Cape Town employee, Wendy Kloppers, had been gunned down while inspecting a, a, a site that was manufacturing and building what is gonna be the largest uh, human settlements development in the city of Cape Town. These are very real conditions under which workers have to work. And so we're trying to understand the complexities that come with this uh, criminality. So as we agreed that that poverty cannot be the only inhibitor or driver for this. It can contribute to it, but it's not a justification, most certainly for it. I'm wondering then, and maybe just to build on some of your thoughts, Tim Borney, whether our violent past as, uh, in this country is, has led us down this path. Um, of course, we've had apartheid. We've had the way in which apartheid was resisted. But apartheid in and of itself was an act of violence. And so we've seen that violence being passed on from generation to generation. Is there a case to be made that South Africa is sometimes an inherently violent society and that is as a consequence of the hand that was dealt to us very many years ago? Um, I could say that's, that's true. And at the same time, um, we, can, we cannot I mean, I personally believe we cannot stay in one spot. Um, let, me, let me say why I'm saying that. Um, we, we, we are not a violent society. And no one is born violent. Uh, but somehow, the, the circumstances uh, that you grow under uh, maybe might groom you as a violent person. For example, if I grow up in a violent home, I see my dad beating my mom all the time. Mm. As a child, I'm watching growing up and I, I'm seeing this as a way of living. This is how people are treated. So there there are two, um, there could be two results. I could be deciding as a young man that I'm not gonna be like my dad, mm. or I can do what my dad is doing. Um, so there's two. So I don't think we can always blame apartheid in, in everything else that happens. I think at some point, it's individual's choice and decisions. Um, even though um, sometimes it's exposure when you're growing up, you grow up in a violent um, home or a violent house, and, and then you, you choose what, what decision you make. For example, we don't, you don't teach kids this is how you grow up and live. Mm. Kids, kids watch. They want to do what dad is doing, for example, or girls want to do what mommy is doing. So there's two approaches there. So that's why I'm saying we can never only blame apartheid. Um, for example, you find that some parents that are growing up never really experience apartheid. Yeah. But they have taken what they've seen happening in the household. And I think, Michael, you can back that up by the amount of 
of young kids that are running around with weapons today. Surely, of course, we can ask the question, where do those weapons come from? What territory are they fighting to protect? You know, for whose illicit gain? These are, 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 are follow-on questions we can most definitely ask. But the reality is that there's a kid running around with a gun in Mitchell's plane, shooting randomly, and sometimes in the process, innocently shoots dead a primary school child. Now, Tasserit, sometimes I believe that it is not only randomly, but kids as young as 11 years old are being recruited by gangs in order to go into a hit. What we have experienced now at some of the schools we have seen is that uh, there's a gang, the Fancy Boys, which are recruiting youngsters from school, and if those kids don't want to belong, then they are being threatened or they make examples of them. We have seen a number of, of, of mass shootings where young people have been targeted. The last one was in Rockens. We have seen also youngsters being killed in Tafelsach just by walking in a group or sitting in a park. So I don't see this as, a, as just a random shootings or, or kids being killed uh, uh, just because they're in the crossfire. It is sending out a message and it is intimidating our communities and these young kids. If you don't join us, this will happen to you. So I think part of it is a deliberate strategy mm -hmm. to instill fear in our young people to, re to, to, to join these gangs. Yeah, and how far down the battle do you think, uh, Francina, we've gone? Uh, are, are we in a state at the moment where given 11-year-old kids that are running around with guns and being recruited at the moment, that we're sitting with an intergenerational challenge here? Yes, um, definitely, it, it, is, it has become an intergenerational challenge. But I also want to respond to the issue of apartheid and its contribution. Um, I would agree partially with the speaker that spoke from Mosaic, but I also think we are still being haunted by the remnants of apartheid. If we look at the spatial planning of our communities, where are our townships situated? The, the density, the overcrowdedness. Um, I might be trying to instill discipline within the home, um, not practicing violence within the home, but our kids are not protected when they go out of the home because mm -hmm. our communities, children as young as 11, they're running around with guns, uh, people stabbing each other on the streets, robbing, and it, it, it can be seen by your children, and, and that further also inculcates the culture of violence, which we can also then trace back um, from our past. Uh, government has tried its utmost to change some of the policies, the legislation, but much more needs to be done um, to change the culture that we currently experience of violence in our communities. Um, so yeah. Um, that that would be my input on the issue of of where we're coming from and where we are now uh, in terms of violence in our communities. I suppose we are we are not just talking here about the fact that we see uh, eleven year old kids running around with guns. There seems to be a deliberate establishment of, of a criminal network and an enterprise. And Michael, you spoke a little bit about this a, a short while ago, but I want to pick up on the Ralph Stanfield case that we sit with right now, because this directly links to the ability of the worker to get the job, to be the, the mixer and the brick layer and all of these sorts of things, and you know, contribute towards the building of the house, and the house then gets to service the community, etc. Now, projects like that cannot proceed because it would appear that there are, uh, are criminal masterminds that have established enterprises to the point where they've infiltrated local council to, 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 to rig tenders based on what is being revealed in the courts at the moment, that it, it goes to show you the extent to which this criminal enterprise is able to establish itself. Now, you see, it's a very complex issue because it deals also with collusion from politicians. So it seems that these criminal gangs, they've started to move into where the money is inter infrastructure projects, huge infrastructure projects like housing. And that is where the money is really. And it's very complex. 
for the only community person from the outside, oh, this housing development, it looked nice. We will be able to benefit. But the underhand dealings and what happens behind the scenes where brown envelopes and money is being moved, gifts being given and all of that, that is something that the police needs to get really all the expertise in in order to deal with some of these, whether they get auditors in to review all of these tenders that has been issued, not only by the city of Cape Town municipality, across the country and see what officials got criminal links and to whom these companies are linked to. Because I can tell you from what we've heard and the court documents that is now out in the public, it runs deep. Yeah. So it's a very complex issue and we need politicians that are clean. We need to have an independent review of all city contracts that has been issued not only in within housing but also the security tenders, the water tenders, electricity tenders so that we can come to the bottom of this. It, it is indeed why the state is calling it a, a criminal enterprise because that is definitely what it so does sound like. Once we return from the break, I want to understand, do we need, you know, a krachtadag approach to fighting crime? Is should to kill a policy that we need to revisit without being too sensitive about it? That and more once we do return from the break, do stay with us. We are an online news website that brings you news, analysis and perspectives from working class marginalized communities and labor. government. Elicha is published by Workers World Media Productions and is a bilingual website as we cover labor, health, education and local government issues in English and Isikos. To get community, national and international news from Elicha, please subscribe to our website and download our mobile app. We are sitting with a real complex case here of criminality that has become so interwoven into our society. It's entrenched so much so that, you know, going to work and holding on to a job is very difficult. We cannot imagine the amount of jobs that are being lost uh, in communities with these housing projects being put on hold, other infrastructure, because with housing, it's not just the bricklayer, it's the plumber, it's the conveyancer, it's you know, all of those things that are involved uh, in it. And those jobs are under threat because there's extortion that's happening. And that extortion isn't just, you know, uh, as they would say, some young lad that decides to, to go and find an opportunity, that criminal enterprises are running this. There's an illicit market that is so deeply entrenched. And this is, in part, the conversation that we've been having. Of course, then the question is, uh, we can't blame apartheid too much. Yes, we have a violent past. It could influence the way in which society has developed, but not the justification for it. Uh, we sit with what we sit right now, which is a very terrible case of violence that is running amok at the moment. Uh, how do we respond to that? Of course, there are, and there's a social development response to it, but there's also a very hard policing response to it. And is that policing response one in which we say fight fire with fire. I, I, I want to get into that quickly with you, Tim <laughs> Um it's, it's, it's a challenging one. Um, uh, I'm saying it's a challenging one because we're dealing with people's lives. And, and I've, I've followed uh, cases, I mean, uh, stories around killing in Joburg, killing KZN. in KZN. Yeah. And, and I, I would say, um, rightfully so. I would defend myself if someone wants. I mean, as a police yeah. officer, I would defend myself if I'm chasing a criminal and then they start shooting at me. Of course, I'm going to defend myself. Um, but also, we have, um, you know, human rights. Who has a right to kill? 
I don't think anyone has a right to kill someone in this country. And therefore, that challenges us to find uh, different strategies on how, how we track and how we solve the challenges that we face with. And, and I'm, I'm saying it's challenging because, yeah, there is no one that has a right to kill. If, if, if a, someone would say, shoot to kill, yeah. um, would shoot to kill, shoot to kill because I'm defending, or shoot to kill because there's a scene happening. Mm. Uh, so me, it needs to be very um, thought and very, you know, technically looked at as to how do, who do, how do I shoot and who yeah. do I shoot at. It's most definitely a complex situation because yeah. when that shoot to kill drama happened, yes, there are these sensitivities, as it should be around human rights. Uh, but as we see in KZN at the moment, um, you know, the, the police is saying, well, there's some of the people dying because they're shooting at us, and you know, we just happen to shoot better because we are trained mm -hmm. in, in that way. Uh, is the sentiment that I'm getting coming out of out of KZN, and and and, and, and Francina, you know, it, it will always be a contestable issue the way in which we. We fight crime, but you know, do we at this time throw support behind the police and say go after these guys, or do we become academic about what social interventions we need to to, to get into this into in responding to this crime? Yes, we we do have a constitution and a bill of rights that promote uh, the rights of everyone in this country, especially the right to life. Mm. Uh, but for me, it's if I need to defend myself and I'm a police officer, I will defend myself and um, ensure that I preserve my life. So in the instances that was reported, it was also reported that the perpetrators of this extortion crime was shooting on the police and the police obviously had the right also to defend themselves. Um, we are not promoting a situation where shoot to kill must happen because a crime is happening, but it should happen when a life of a police official trying to execute his or her duties um, are being threatened. And for that reason, I would, I would really support that police do um, protect themselves, protect the communities which are at risk, and ensure that they enforce the law because that is their constitutional mandate in terms of the constitution of South Africa. And, and, and Michael, the, you know, the 11-year-old the kid that we spoke about, you know, the reality is that the, the living conditions for very many of these people are not great. You know, you have so many people that live in squeezed like sardines into one little home. You have backyard dwellings that are not in the best of shape, street lights that don't work, hardly ever work. Mm -hmm. um, they don't have a safe space to go to. There aren't any opportunities uh, available to them. And when it comes down to survival, you know, getting a 20 rand a day for being a gun runner or holding drugs or selling drugs, becomes the, most, the more easier way out. And so while we contemplate policing as an, as an approach to this, surely it is a, a social development plan of some sort that is required to redirect the energies of these young children. Now, clearly what we have seen is the Premier and the Western Cape also have its area-based teams where government departments within the province are supposed to work together Mr. Spain is also one of those designated areas. But what we have seen, the reality is that school kids are being thrown into gangs. They are being targeted. But the support service for those kids on school that is affected by violence and by gangs, it's not there. The reality is there's about one social worker that must deal with all the schools within Mr. Spain, and there's more than 70 schools in Mr. Spain. There's maybe only one psychologist, and it is a reality that not all the support services are there. The truancy program that was there in the Department of Social Development a couple of years ago, it has been scaled down because of budget cuts. So what I'm saying it is, there are NGOs that are working in that space that are doing government's work, 
but even their funding is being cut. So our community. And, and I mean, a typical example, sorry to, to butt in there, Michael, but a typical example is the Western Cape Education Department now cutting the, the budget allocations for teachers who would have had their contracts renewed. Some of the schools, I may add, is in Mitchell's Plain, which is going to take classroom sizes to well above 45 to 50 kids in a classroom. I can mention an example. Mitchell's Plain High, that was a prefab school that was built on the premises of, of, of Tafelsig High, which is now also catering for matric, about a couple of years ago that was put up in order to deal with the learner crisis, accommodation of learner crisis. 11 teachers are going. So what will happen to those teachers that are going mm -hmm. and another 10 teachers are going from another school? Mm. And it's across Mr. Spring there's going to be cuts. And three weeks ago, I went to give a, a, a talk on crime to primary school children at a particular school. Mm. And in that classroom already, there was 46 kids. So if you take a teacher away, one teacher away, that will increase the, the, the classroom capacity, but the teacher numbers are being lowered. Yeah. So it is unacceptable, and we say that we need to support our, 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 our teachers, we need to support our children, and we need to support our communities to allow these teachers to be back at school. Yeah. Because it's a crisis, and within that crisis, you cannot create a further crisis where we have adequate policing, we have adequate uh, social development uh, infrastructure within our communities. In the past, you have recreation and sports come and play, which the city have rolled out. That is now far and few in between. So you can see the support services where we could keep, keep kids occupied is no longer there. So with this budget cut, it is unacceptable, and we as communities need to rally our communities in order to say no to these budget cuts. Yeah, and I mean, you know, uh, maybe just a couple of seconds, Temboni, we surely need to then have a social compact discussion Yeah. as a country. Yes, no, we do. Uh, but well, I think one of the approaches we, we're trying to do in different communities is to have um, uh, what we call family strengthening program. Okay. Where we try and uh, teach parents on how to be with one another in front of the kids. Uh, because sometimes, if you are a role model for your kids, then you, you yeah, are about to raise in a, a, a very positive kid. Yeah. So I think we need to maybe spread that to different communities, but at the moment, the focus was Mitchell's play. Every little bit will help, I'm quite certain of it. And if we zoom out a little bit further and we come down to what's the nub of all of these things, it is government austerity programs uh, that affects the, not just the workers' lives, but the societal fabric that we have on top of moral regeneration and other issues that certainly confound this very terrible issue. Thank you very much once again for tuning in. We'll continue the conversation at you know weeks to come, uh, certainly as we continue to look at how we protect jobs, but also save society in the process. This has been Workers' World. Thank you very much for tuning in. Have a lovely day. Bye-bye.